determining how to um, give both meaningful academic opportunities for the study of multi-faith leadership, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what does meaningful dialogue look like, what is it not? Um, how do you not only build a bridge, but then continue to walk across it? And what does the field of multi-faith leadership look like? This is in its infant stages, um, but we do hope that this field emerges and uh, we will have been one of the first to have imagined it. Hi, I'm Ellie Kohanim here with Shalom TV uh, covering today's American Jewish Committee Women's Leadership Division luncheon in partnership with AJC New York here at New York's Pierre Hotel. We will honor Chelsea Clinton and Linda Mills for their remarkable leadership of NYU's of Many Institute for Multi-Faith Leadership and the example they have set for all of us. They were inspired by the extraordinary interreligious role modeling of NYU's Imam Khalid Latif and Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, whose positive voices have been heard and followed well beyond the confines of NYU. The rabbi and the imam are here with us today. This recognition couldn't be more natural for AJC. We at AJC have always believed that global Jewish advocacy must include concern for people of all faiths and backgrounds. And we believe that cultural diversity has been good for America and for the Jewish people. AJC has been at the forefront of interreligious relations for more than a century. As early as the 1920s, AJC melded its concern for people of all faiths with political activism when it filed an amicus curiae brief with the Supreme Court in Pierce versus Society of Sisters defending the right of Catholic parents to send their children to parochial schools, something we Americans, Christians, Jews, and Muslims and others take for granted today. AJC is particularly proud of the leadership role it has taken in advancing Muslim-Jewish relations internationally, nationally, and regionally. We have facilitated the participation of Muslims from around the world in Project Interchange, AJC's premier educational introductory trip to Israel, tailored for the world's diverse leaders of tomorrow. And AJC's diplomatic missions regularly include Muslim countries. Just recently, with support from the Ravitz Foundation, AJC released a university-level study of Muslim-Jewish relations in Detroit and convened a day-long follow-up conference that brought together Muslim and Jewish leaders who are committed, notwithstanding the challenges, to advancing greater understanding between our communities, just as AJC led and continues to lead the revolution in Christian-Jewish relations, we will forge the path for Muslim-Jewish and other interreligious relationships as well. In this expanding interreligious relations arena, we couldn't have better inspirations than Chelsea Clinton and Linda Mills and the path-breaking religious professionals, Rabbi Sarna and Imam Latif. To get today's celebration off on the right foot, we are pleased to welcome the Imam and the Rabbi as they join us in leading an interreligious invocation, Rabbi and Imam. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life, guider of hearts, bless this gathering and all those who are in it. 
Assembled here today are men and women who truly represent everything great about this city. Shower upon us your infinite mercy and instill within each of us a sound sense of respect for others. Grant the continu continued strength needed to all of our honorees and the AJC to keep doing the amazing work that they do. Make their successes of today be the first of many and grant us and them more success on every tomorrow that we see. Protect us from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings, O Lord, and guide and bless us all. Amen. Elokea ruchot l'chol basar, God who is seen as a master of spirits, one who blends together different personalities. And great thanks, and inspired by the piety and justice seeking of my good friend Imam Khalid Latif, of the creativity and storytelling ability of Linda Mills, and the thoroughly principled way of thinking of Chelsea Clinton, let God continue to bring us all together for an enlightened purpose. And let us say, Amen. I'm here with Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, who is university chaplain at New York University here in New York. Rabbi Sarna, um, I've been hearing wonderful things about your Of Many Institute at NYU. Can you tell us a little bit about Of Many? Sure. Uh, of Many started as a way to really codify and, and um, spread the work that Imam Khal Latif and I have, have been doing, mostly through our community service, our co-teaching together and uh, creating a space, actually a physical location, where all different kinds of students, that is from all different religious backgrounds, are coming together to, uh, for worship, for study, for prayer. Uh, not necessarily together, but under the same roof. So you mean to say that Jewish students and Muslim students and Christian students literally will come together in one space and worship? Uh, right, not necessarily together, not at the same time, but there's an awareness that there's no dedicated space to any one religious group uh, and that everyone is in a space that they're really sharing. And that's designed to be a metaphor for what the world actually is, is that there's a lot that we have to learn to share. Um, okay, so I would agree. I think all of us at Shalom TV would agree there's a lot for us to share. What specifically are you hoping to accomplish with the Of Many Institute? Well, one of the key things that we've learned about the 21st century is that religion is back. It's not a, uh, a feature of human existence that is, that is going to subside. Identity is real. And that uh, more and more cultures are coming into contact with more and more cultures with greater frequency. That's just the 21st century. So if, if we want to be able to live uh, without a clash of civilizations, but a way that civilizations interact uh, in a healthy and productive way, that means we have to be able to learn to be both rooted in our own identity uh, we'll still understand others. So tell me a little bit about what specifically you're doing at Of Many that's helping students gain this understanding. Uh, the first thing that we've done is we've created the first minor, academic minor, in multi-faith leadership. So there's a core course that Imam Khalid and I teach together uh, called Multi-Faith Leadership in the 21st Century. And then there are a whole host of courses which really challenge students to see how developing a multi-faith attitude to the country's problems, the city's problems, the world's problems, uh, can enable a, a more secure and productive future. Rabbi Sarna, I think that you are addressing some of the most um, sensitive topics in society today. So tell me specifically in terms of Jewish-Muslim relations on your campus, how are things going? Sure, so uh, one of the things that we've decided to do is that recognizing that unless we're proactive in creating a uh, relationships, face-to-face -face relationships between students which build up social capital, which gets students focused on the same goals, uh, which and uh, around shared values, that uh, too often the dominant narrative on college campuses of Jewish and Muslim communities is that they're at odds with each other, they fight with each other, they, uh, they provoke each other. And what we've been really working to do is to create a calendar of events throughout the year where there are planned sessions of whether dialogue groups or uh, community service, where, where there's a, another, uh, it's almost like there's another channel. Right? You don't have to tune in to uh, radicals on either side who are just trying to 
kind of score political points, but actually start with religion. If you start with religion, there's a lot of common understanding which can be generated. If you start with politics, you'll likely get nowhere. So can you tell us in terms of the students that you're dealing with, how is it resonating with them? I mean, is it in fact resonating to start with religion? Uh, you, you'd be amazed, but it, it really is. When students sit down and they talk together about uh, dietary restrictions, they talk about holidays, they talk about modesty, they talk about family, they talk about marriage, uh, you'd be amazed at how much uh, Jewish and Muslim students have in common. Uh, even uh, the most religious of each kind, specifically the most religious of each kind, uh, have, have much more in common than they e ever would have thought. So Rabbi Sarna, if you had a message for young people out across the country who are watching Shalom TV with us, what, what would that message be for them? I think the message is simple. Make every friendship historic. Go over to the people who you would think you would be least likely to befriend and develop a relationship which is based on really understanding another person's concerns and then see where it goes. Fabulous. Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, University Chaplain at NYU, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. On thank Shalom you. TV. Thank you very much. So in New York University, we've actually seen a real unique trend uh, where many universities in the country, even those that are historically rooted in specific faith-based kind of communities, are moving in a direction that doesn't necessarily embrace spiritual diversity on its campus. NYU has taken unique steps to really embrace spiritual diversity uh, and provide not just programs and services, but uh, actual space to spiritual and religious groups on campus. Uh, in a new facility that they call the Global Center for Academic and Spiritual Life. Um, and within that is kind of housed this uh, institute that we call the Of Many Institute for Multi-Faith Leadership. Uh, essentially our goal with it is to bring together groups and communities that don't necessarily interact with each other too much, um, but once they are brought together they're able to do a lot in terms of recognition and awareness of diverse populations uh, as well as see how they're uniquely poised to really come together and take on a lot of societal ills and do meaningful service work together. So how specifically do these students take on societal ills? You know, we've seen different student groups come together on different campaigns. Uh, this past year, a variety of our religious and spiritual groups came together uh, to do an awareness campaign on trafficking. Um, you know, child prostitution, uh, female prostitution, you know, things relevant to that subject. Uh, we've seen a lot of different movements in terms of uh, relief efforts post-Hurricane Sandy, uh, people coming together to do canned food drives and uh, things along those lines, collecting clothes and winter jackets and winter socks for the homeless, um, especially in this past winter when the weather was severely cold. but. They're doing it now with new partners and new allies, people who they didn't necessarily think they could do this with. Um, and they're getting so much more out of it because the work in and of itself gives a sense of fulfillment. Uh, but bringing together partners and allies in that effort who they never thought they could do this kind of work with side by side uh, really just, I think, humanizes the relationship that much more. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that you're bringing together students of different faiths to do volunteer work, and is that correct? So, Imam, how, how does that specifically lend itself to understanding? I mean, I could see myself standing next to you in a soup kitchen line, and I'm doing some work, and you're doing some work. How does that actually build bridges between the students? Well, you know, when you have university students, they're at a very formative period of their identity. I think to capitalize and make an advantage to them the diversity that exists around them and set up opportunities for that diversity to aspire and actually harness a pluralism that's very much necessary. Uh, one that tells us that we can work together but also stand up for one another even though we're coming from very distinct backgrounds. We're coming from perhaps different sets of values and ideals but we learn to celebrate our diversity and through that celebration we recognize that we have so much more in common uh, that we can really build off of as well. So Imam uh, Latif, um, you're bringing together I imagine a lot of Jewish, Muslim and Christian students and um, what happens when there is uh, some sort of global event which you know usually does cause um, discussion and sometimes uh, I would say unhealthy um, uh, conversations on, on a lot of campuses. 
I mean, I think the advantage of having a community that exists between larger communities uh, enables for student-driven leadership to become a catalyst in bringing together people to talk to each other rather than talking at each other. Uh, when we grow up in our own narratives, uh, at times we don't really have too much opportunity to understand and engage the narrative of the other. And having relationships that exist prior to moments of tension make it a little bit more facilitated, the kind of discussions and dialogues that can take place when those moments of tension arise. Our students come together uh, every year to do relief work in the South. Uh, our students come together and they share religious experiences with one another, but they also come together organically and they have lunch together and dinner together and they go to the movies together and they learn each other's names and in turn the narratives attached to those names and within that they're now talking to a person and hearing from them their experiences and perspectives on issues that lower the stakes to a place where it's not so polarizing. It's not you know, as antagonizing as we kind of see uh, when people come and they're not really speaking to people that they already have a friendship and a relationship with. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And so I'm just curious, do you have any success stories for us? Is there anything that you're particularly proud of with your students that, that, that they did and it just made you feel like of many institutes is doing what its mission is? Yeah, you know, I think uh, every day we, we see that there's success stories. We um, see students who after a week, a month, you know, a little bit longer, will themselves engage through a, a framework of vulnerability, uh, just their own experiences, and talk about how moved that they've been, uh, and their own preconceived ideas and notions and stereotypes have broken down. You know, I think we can point to successes and say, you know, we raised this much money for this cause. We, you know, collected this much food for, you know, this group that was in need. And it's not to undermine those as successes, but I think the real success stories lie in the friendships that have been developed and have been carried forward. So every time I get an email from a student who graduated saying that, you know, I just went to the wedding of this person that we went on that trip with, or did you hear that so-and-so just had a child, or it's really unfortunate I was just at the funeral of this person's loved one who just passed away, the sheer fact that you know, months and years after they've graduated, they're still with each other at these major life events, to me gives us an indication that there's something really special happening here and that they're not being brought together just for specific moments where it's about a panel discussion or a film screening or anything like that, but the moments that they are brought together uh, have had such an impact that it's informing so many other special moments later on in their lives. and. With of many, what we're trying to do is institutionalize those experiences so that we can ensure that there's a certain longevity to this kind of work. And we also can empower those who are doing this work elsewhere, uh, who it's either similar to our experiences at NYU or they're doing it you know, at such a deeper level. But the unfortunate reality is the prevailing narrative that exists is one that becomes very polarizing. And it's one that's rooted in kind of uh, more of a sense of animosity um, rather than you know, collaborative efforts and mutual respect. And I think as we flip the narrative and we say the norm is people are kind of doing together, you're gonna see that much more amazingness come out of it all. Sounds really incredible. And so my final question for you is we're here at AJC um, celebrating and honoring Linda Mills and Chelsea Clinton. Can you tell us how they got involved with the Of Many Institute? Sure. Um, so the Of Many Institute was actually co-founded by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Sarna, Linda Mills, who is at New York University uh, and wears a lot of different hats and has many different roles there, uh, as well as Chelsea Clinton um, and myself. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of this kind of came forward from both Linda Mills uh, and Chelsea Clinton's recognition of some of the work that was being done across faith communities uh, led by our students at New York University's campus and a certain urgency to institutionalize that to ensure that just not this immediate generation but generations that would come at New York University would be able to benefit from these things that are taking place now. Really amazing work. Well, thank you so much thank Imam you. Khalid Latif for yep. joining us on Shalom TV. Thank you. Of course, it is my pleasure to join you at this event in honor of the AJC Women's Leadership Board, 
and the AJC New York Regional Office. We, of course, are honoring recipients of the AJC Interfaith Leadership Award, Chelsea Clinton and Linda Mills, for their pioneering work in advancing cooperative interfaith social action. AJC takes great pride in publicly applauding the unique work, the vision, and the work that you are doing. It is our, really our honor, to award the AJC Interfaith Leadership Award to Chelsea Clinton and Professor Dot Linda Mills. Chelsea Clinton's extraordinary commitment to repairing our world, combined with her talent in bringing people together, are clearly exemplified in her work co-founding the Of Many Institute with Linda. In addition to co-founding the Of Many Institute, Linda Mills' position as NYU's Vice Chancellor of, for Global Programs and University Life led her to co-produce and direct an important documentary relaying the transmission of trauma from the Holocaust to 9-11. Her efforts have had a profound impact on diverse communities. We honor Chelsea Clinton and Linda Mills for their trailblazing leadership. Okay. Do you have the inscription? Yep. This handmade glass Sadaka box is etched with the following words. Your visionary leadership in advancing interfaith partnerships in pursuit of the common good has paved a vital pathway for all who seek to build a world based on generosity and mutual respect. April 29th, 2014. And now, continuing the dialogue, it is my honor to invite our own AJC executive, David Harris, who needs no introduction to this audience, and our honorees, Chelsea Clinton and Dr. Linda Mills, Please join me in welcoming David, Chelsea, and Linda for a very interesting conversation. So, we have this remarkable institute called uh, the Of Many. Let's begin at the beginning. How did the two of you meet? How did the idea emerge? Um, and how do you assess where it is today and where you want it to go? Um, well, thank you, David. First, I also like to echo your gratitude, um, particularly to Betty and everyone at AJC for welcoming us so warmly here um, this afternoon. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, the previous honoree, uh, Dr. Gerberding, someone whom I've long admired um, for what she had to say, kind of linking uh, the, the pathogens of disease to the pathogens of um, diseased ideology that really resonated with me. Um, partly because that is what we see as the beginning of, of many. Um, too often, indeed, as she said, the pages of our newspapers as well as the content of our conversations are focused on what is wrong with the world. That's somewhat understandable given how much ails us in so many ways. Um, but we really believe there is also a lot that is right with the world. Um, and so Linda and I um, became committed to helping Yehuda and Khalid codify the remarkable work that they were already doing, um, not only at NYU, but more broadly with student groups, um, with communities here in New York City, beyond New York City, um, because we believed that with sort of a more formal mechanism, so much more could be done, um, but that it was also important to make a long-term statement, um, that this was something that we were investing in as a different, model and paradigm for the ways in which communities too frequently characterized by antagonism could not only come together, as you heard in the trailer, but work together. And that too often we start with the political and then move to the personal, instead of starting with the personal and moving to the political. Um, and that it was important for NYU, but also candidly for New York City, um, to put a stake into something that was different, more positive, more affirmative, a repudiation of kind of the too frequent cynicism that is 
often um, our default position. And so that's really why we began of many. It's why we continue um, to invest a lot of time and energy in of many. Um, it's why Linda had the idea to make a film, um, which Yehuda Holland and I were a bit skeptical about, candidly, um, having not ever made a film before, unlike Linda, who had made Alf Peter Zane, as you heard about in Betty's introduction. Um, but I know um, we're all incredibly grateful that she took us on this journey of making the film um, because it enables us to now broaden the dialogue um, even more expansively than anything we could have done previously. Um, because one of the dimensions of the work that we're particularly committed to is not only um, to talk about what we are doing at NYU and in New York City, but also to invite others to join the conversation. And we're very eager to learn about what is happening and what is working on other campuses and other communities uh, in other cities and even in other countries. Um, so please take that as an open invitation. If anyone in this room knows of other kind of interfaith or multi-faith work that you think is not only episodic but transformational, um, we want to hear about it so that we can either help support it um, or learn from it or both. So that's why we're here um, and that's why we're so grateful to be here with all of you. Chelsea, thank you. Linda, you want to add something? I want to add something. I wish my mother could see me right now. <laughs> So um, my mother's 89. Uh, she escaped uh, Vienna during the Holocaust. Um, and it has been quite the journey, but I'd say that she would, this would be a very proud moment. So Chelsea, if you had your druthers looking ahead, where would you like to see the Institute go, first of all, on the NYU campus, and then more broadly? Do you see it as a potentially global initiative, um, a local initiative, or something in between? Well, already um, what we've seen at NYU is that we are struggling to keep up with the demand, really? which is what we call in my family a high-class problem, um, but still, <laughs> still one that needs a solution. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and so we are um, constantly trying to figure out how to clone Halid and Yehuda. Um, and are just tremendously grateful for the continuous opportunity that the students' enthusiasm for this work provides us then to do this work. And so determining how to um, give both meaningful academic opportunities for the study of multi-faith leadership, what has worked, what hasn't worked, what does meaningful dialogue look like, what is it not? Um, how do you not only build a bridge but then continue to walk across it? And then complementary co-curricular activities where students get out of the comfort zone of the NYU community and really are able to build relationships in different ways that often are more durable um, when uh, events like what we're seeing happen unfold in the Middle East at the moment occur. So that kind of the rhetoric of taking the personal to the political doesn't become just rhetoric, but the building blocks for meaningful dialogue, conversation, and hopefully um, the compassion that is necessary, I think, to personal and political conversations, and too often is rare. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to do even more at NYU right now, um, but we're also trying to figure out how to share what we've learned has worked, to be candid about what we've learned hasn't worked, uh, and again, to learn from other institutions are or other people kind of with a common purpose. So we had our first conference recently and we had more than um, 50 different universities and colleges attend to talk about either what they were doing or what they hoped to do. Um, and that meant so much to us that we were able to learn alongside others but also to share what we ourselves had learned. Um, and we hope to do more of that um, to help other colleges and universities scale their efforts. One of the challenges is that there are more than 250 um, rabbis on college and university campuses, um, and there are only 31 imams on colleges and university campuses, so also trying to help um, figure out what we can do to ameliorate that disequilibrium so that there can be more of an equal partnership between different communities on college campuses. Um, to help cities who are increasingly thinking about this, including our own city, learn from what we've done, um, particularly among young people, the so-called millennials that we are privileged to work with. 
Uh, and so we're constantly trying to answer that question because I think the right answer to your question, David, is a dynamic one. Um, and it's incumbent on us to be open to that dynamism, to not be discomforted by it, and to just continue to engage with it. Um, so ultimately, we hope that more people are more optimistic and less cynical, and more optimistic not um, just because of rose-tinted glasses, um, but because there are real reasons to be optimistic, because there are more Holid and Yehudas in the world, and there are more young people um, than there are cynics, candidly, of any age, uh, who believe that the world not only can be, but must be different. So, just one follow-up question, if I may, Chelsea, before turning back to you, Linda. Do you see this continuing as a bilateral conversation between Muslims and Jews? Or do you see this more as a multilateral, interreligious conversation that brings in Christians and non-monotheistic religions, which increasingly are appearing on American campuses? How do you see so, it going? Well, at NYU, that has already happened. Although um, very much the relationship between Halad and Yehuda and the shared work that they had already done provided the original impetus now of many has um, Christian partners from across uh, different denominations, as well as non-denominational, um, ecumenical, more spiritual partners. And so the ambit at NYU is already quite broad, although certainly um, very non-exclusive, so others are continued to be welcomed. Um, and we certainly believe that the more people that not only participate in the conversation, but feel ownership over the solutions, um, the better off we're all likely to be. Although, indeed, at the beginning, I was the token Christian. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that that's no longer the case. We also consider you an honorary Jew. Uh, well, thank you. My, my husband's family would be very grateful to hear you say that. That's as close as I'll get to the non-policy questions. <laughs> Linda, um, for many, the elephant in the room, when Muslims and Jews get together, though, is that with shared meals, even with share, shared faith experiences, there are political issues that often enter. H how do you find from the experience of the Institute and your broader work on campus that those differences, which have appeared on NYU as they have on other campuses, how are they managed and can this partnership help manage those differences when they surface somewhere in the NYU campus? Yeah, I, I think it is um, obvious or evident from our own personal experiences that when we know we've built a bridge or a strong friendship or relationship, that when a conflict tests it, that it's possible to figure out how to get through that. But without that history, it's a very different story. And so what Of Many has really, um, I think, built here is a bridge between Jewish and Muslim students that allows then for the possibility of conflict to occur, but a depth of relationship that can be um, drawn on in the face of that conflict. And without that, it just becomes tit for tat, or name calling and name calling. So I do think that we live, we live now at NYU in a much more embracing um, space that allows for that conflict to emerge and to feel less anxious when it does. So that's what I'd say. And, um, I, 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 and we have been tested over many, many um, years now. And um, the next conflict will come. And um, Khalid and Yehuda and the hundreds of students committed to multi-faith work at NYU will stand up and say, we can work through this one, too. Well, and I, the beginning of Holly and Yehuda's relationship on a deep level, as um, is shown in the film, um, as I hope all of you will see, um, was during the Danish cartoon incident. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, particularly among NYU students, the understanding of their relationship as having kind of been forged in what was a tense moment that each of them were committed to diffusing so that it could be more of a learning opportunity for students and not um, characterized by characterizations, literally. Um, and that their relationship has continued to evolve through shared moments of 
joy, as you saw in the trailer when all of us were at um, Holland and Priya's wedding, uh, but also moments of true tension, I think is not only a, a testament to their commitment to one another and to this work, um, but also then is more relatable for students. Because even without the political dimension, relationships of any meaningful depth are challenging. I think particularly when you're in college, which was a long time ago for me, but when you're kind of Oy. trying to, <laughs> well, I, I, I feel that way in particular as Mark and I think about our, um, our joyful news that we feel quite mature. Oh, well, thank you. Um, but you know, that, that students are navigating lots of different identity questions. And the, the candor and the humility, um, but also the integrity with which Holland and Yehuda have navigated these questions and have done so in such a, you know, a, a public way among their students, I think then makes it easier for students to imagine themselves being able to do that um, with other people who are different in a myriad of ways, not only religious, but also otherwise. And it's one of the many things that I deeply respect uh, about them not only as friends, but also as leaders. Mm. Thank you, Chelsea. So, Lyndon, let me ask you, um, NYU is probably no more than one mile north of um, the World Trade Center. Um, does the proximity of the World Trade Center impact the work of Muslims and Jews on campus? And given this most recent controversy over the film to be associated with the opening of the new museum, um, can, can, can this initiative help address those issues, or does it again become a potentially divisive question on campus? So let me um, untangle, because there's a lot packed into that question, um, both personally, but also in terms of the work that Khaled and Yehuda have done over these many years. I live three blocks from the World Trade Center, and actually on 9-11, we were at the elementary school closest to the World Trade Center, PS 234. My son was in his third day of kindergarten. So um, we were out of our house then for two months, and that actually became the impetus for Avidarzain, um, my first film, and um, the journey that I took to understand the connection between 9-11 and the Holocaust. So against that backdrop, I have witnessed quite directly and personally the experience of living downtown um, Park 51 and all that that has meant, as well as the development of the memorial, the 9-11 memorial, and all that that will mean. Khaled um, has created an environment, let me start with Khaled and then move to their joint work, but Khaled has created an environment at NYU in which he has welcomed Muslims from all over the city to worship in our spiritual life building every week. And Khaled's work has been exemplary in this sense in that it is not just about students, but we invite everyone from the community, the Muslim community in this case, to worship at NYU. And we have created a building that is labeled spiritual life for just that purpose. So much of what's now happening at NYU is embodied in this space. And I should shout out that Evie Klein is actually in the room and was an architect that worked on developing and thinking about the ways in which we worship across. A very challenging effort in which all the, multi, all the leaders, religious leaders at NYU, including the spiritual leaders, um, came together to ask the question, how do we do this across? I come from Los Angeles where there is what feels like endless space. So one would never think that you would have Muslims coming to worship in our synagogue. And yet New York gives us that possibility, that opportunity. So what I'd say is that the proximity of the multi-faith work that has happened thanks to Yehuda and Khalid's presence at NYU has been very embracing of the city and provides tremendous opportunities for us thinking, to think about the ways in which we can help create that multi-faith pulse in our neighborhood and beyond. So actually, when we read the article about the 9-11 memorial, a number of people sent us the article and said, can you do something? Can we show the movie? How do we use the incredibly compelling and, 
and embracing and affirming work that's happening in such a way so as to avoid the kind of conflict or at least to address the kind of conflict that that kind of history can, can, can challenge us to, to face. Can you hold the microphone for just sure. another second? Because you mentioned the, your first film, Avidra Zain. And I want to be sure the audience understands what the film is and if they want to see it, how they can access it. So you can access it on, access it on Amazon for $4.99. Um, is there a decimal point between uh, the four and the nine? <laughs> $4.99, it is quite remarkable. I think we get 22 cents of that. Um, and um, it's... What, what's the film about? Yeah, so the film is about the journey that I took to document my mother's experience um, as she transitioned from Vienna to the United States. But it's set against the backdrop of our own experience during 9-11 and particularly our experience with Ronnie, our son, who was five years old at the time. And what we wanted to do, what, what I was really struck by at the moment that 9-11 happened was I needed to answer my son's very compelling question, which is, why do they want to kill us? And I needed to understand that question against the backdrop of my mother's very um, hair-raising story and travel from Vienna to the United States. And so I set us, our family, on this journey. It wasn't always easy, including my mother and my aunt and my father, who was the most reluctant, actually, um, on this journey. But, but our son, who was 10 at the time, was very much a catalyst in asking the hard questions about why it still matters. And so, assuming you like watching irreverent, funny, but brilliant and philosophical 10-year-olds, um, <laughs> you uh, will hopefully uh, enjoy this film, and um, I encourage you to, to go to Amazon and, and look at it. Thanks, Linda. Chelsea, for you, this was your first film that you've, you've done now. What was it like to become a filmmaker? Well, I've already confessed that Hala Dehud and I were a bit um, skeptical at the beginning of this adventure. <laughs> Uh, and yet, I think I can speak for all three of us that we're incredibly grateful that Linda um, was the impetus and the kind of conductor of this journey uh, and that um, none of us would have changed a moment of it. You, thankfully, they're both nodding in the back. Um, <laughs> uh, and it certainly was incredibly humbling to think about how do we distill something that means so much to all of us uh, into a, a cinematic story of you know 33 minutes so that it will be compelling hopefully to others and particularly to young people um, who I think have longer attention spans than many of us think but they're not so long as to be able to sit through a sort of feature length documentary um, and yet not only was it incredible incredibly humbling and clearly a, a learning experience for me. I never thought I, I would make a film. I certainly don't expect to ever make another, but I'm thrilled that never I... Never say never. <laughs> no, I didn't say never. I said I don't expect. Um, uh, but I w became so convinced by Linda's um, kind of intense belief that doing this would enable us to broaden the reach uh, and the circumference, candidly, of those engaged in this work, um, that once sort of we became convinced of that, I think we all sort of shared the zeal of the converted to do whatever we needed to do to create something that we could be equally proud of in a film sense as we are of kind of the ongoing evolution of the of Mini Institute. Um, it was a lot longer than I thought it would be. It took us a couple of years to do this work. Um, it was a lot more fun than I thought it would be. We laughed a lot. Um, and you know, as much as we kind of continue to find ways to take our students out of their comfort zone, I think this experience for at least Holly Hood and I certainly took us out of our comfort zone and enabled us to deepen our, our friendships and um, enabled us to discover that we kind of emerged on the other side of it even more committed to this work um, than we had before, which initially would have seemed um, improbable if not impossible. So I think we're encouraged by how many people have already seen the film and now want to engage in this work, want to share what they are already doing in their own communities. Um, 
kind of in a similar vein, and we certainly hope that that will will continue over over the months and years ahead. So, do you have plans to put this into film festivals? And Linda, that's mine. That's um, yours. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, yes, we have plans to put it into film festivals. Um, we've applied for several. Um, I think we hope to have an international premiere. Um, and then, um, most importantly, which is the reason we made the film, uh, was so that we can use it as an educational tool to expand and enhance and, and our own work, but also to expand, as Chelsea said, the reach, the circumference, and to think with other both thought partners and people who are doing the work about how and what that next level of work might look like. So I think we see it very much as a tool and already have witnessed um, the power of it uh, just over the last couple of weeks in which it's shown. So I think it's been um, inspiring and um, for me humbling um, to think that people want to come and see this story attached to it in the affirmative ways in which Chelsea has described and feel hungry for um, what feels like this very affirmative story of what is possible rather than what is negative and feels um, so um, um, painful, I think. And so I think the inspiration that we have gotten back from what people have felt has been um, um, heartening. So if I may repeat a comment that someone made to me on the way in, someone who knows NYU quite well here in the audience, they said NYU was very lucky because Rabbi Sarna and Imam Latif were there and they were large personalities, and they fit together very well, and they had a common vision. But what if you can't find that magical formula on other campuses? Is it essential that you find a Rabbi Sarna and an Imam Latif? Or are there other ways of going about this where they may not exist in some parts of the country? Uh, I think I have a couple of reactions to that question. Um, well, first, we are tremendously lucky. I would, <laughs> so. I would not quibble with whomever said that. Um, if that was someone applauding, yes, please. Um, <laughs> and I think the person just gave themselves away. Oh, that, that's fine, too. Pat yourself on the back. There's no shame in that. Um, I, I think it is important to have people that are equally committed to this work because it's not easy work. I don't think, though, necessarily um, it would be fair to expect anyone um, kind of at the beginning of this journey to speak with the eloquence and presence that we were all lucky enough to hear when um, Holland and Yehuda gave the invocation earlier. Um, I don't think they probably sounded as confident or eloquent you know, when they really embarked on this shared journey in 2006 either. Um, so I think it's important to recognize um, people's potential for doing this work. And if they have the commitment to it, then to support them to succeed, because we'll all be better off for it. Um, and, and to understand that sometimes it will be a rabbi and an imam, and sometimes it will be students who will be in the vanguard of this work on their campuses or in their communities. Um, and sometimes it will be students who are more spiritual than religious. Sometimes it will be those who aspire to be a imam or a rabbi. Um, and I think it's important that we look for those who share the commitment um, and who have the right mix of confidence and humility um, to manifest that commitment than to expect to find sort of leaders equal to kind of the magnificence of Halid and Yehuda today, now many years after doing the work of of many, but also doing the work of, of serving their own communities, which is still their primary purpose. As much as they are engaged in the work and of many, um, they are still uh, deeply committed to serving the Jewish and Muslim communities on NYU's campus. So I, I'm deeply optimistic uh, that this work will be um, taken up as already being engaged with on other campuses and communities. Um, and I have no doubt there are other Halids and Yehudas in the wings, although I think it would be unfair to those people, whomever they may be, to expect them kind of to emerge fully formed today. Um, but I know that they will get there in their own kind of splendor and success if we support them. 
I might add that Khaled and Yehuda do give trainings. So in addition oh, okay. to um, <laughs> campuses themselves inspiring these lead leaders, that Khaled and Yehuda have traveled now across the country and the world to provide the kind of inspiration and guidance that is necessary for this difficult work. So Linda, as we wrap up, um, I actually went to college before Chelsea. I'm giving away my age. <laughs> when majors were things like sociology and <laughs> You know, straightforward stuff. Now, as I understand it, at NYU, you can do a minor and perhaps one day a major in this area. Yeah. Can you share with us a little bit about how that's constructed? Sure. So this was actually inspired by the fact that we wanted to seed the work that they were doing in the next generation. And the question was how to do that. There was much work happening in a co-curricular sense, right, outside the classroom. But we also wanted to understand the texts and the literature and the research that could underpin a new field called multi-faith leadership. And Chelsea referenced this earlier. And so that was the inspiration for starting a dialogue with faculty and with Khaled and Yehuda and others who were doing this work to think across these many boundaries, academic boundaries, to ask the question, what does the field of multi-faith leadership look like? And we started with um, the Wagner School. Ellen Shaw that was the dean at the time there, and she's here. She's here. And she was an inspiration for this. We started with the Wagner School that has a clear commitment to leadership and thinking about leadership, deconstructing leadership, and how we should do that in the, or how we might do that in the 21st century. And so that's what really took us on this journey. And now there are many courses. Um, I think Khaled and Yehuda have taught several hundred students in their course, which is featured actually in the film at some moment, and um, other faculty who have come to the table to think about and to propose and offer courses across the campus in the field of multi-faith leadership. This is in its infant stages, um, but we do hope that this field emerges and uh, we will have been one of the first to have imagined it. Linda, thank you. Chelsea, thank you very, very much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. And I, I simply want to say before we wrap up that when AJC was founded in 1906, and this is not a history lesson, I assure you, the great interfaith challenge for us was Christian Jewish and particularly Catholic Jewish relations. And nearly a century later, the dreamers at AJC we're able to create a revolution together with our Catholic partners in a relationship. If you come to the AJC Global Forum, you'll see a brief film as we introduce the session on Muslim Jewish relations that AJC defines this as the 21st century challenge of interfaith relations. So I thank you and I bless you for the work you do and we wanted you to see it because it converges so beautifully with what we're doing we wish you strength, and Chelsea, we wish you lots of success in the fall. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for being with us. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM. To GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.